Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 249 for Monday, March 23rd, 2020. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians, as you might expect, and with no surprise, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Social distancing here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. I'm glad we get to get together and do this, even though, like, this is normal for us, for us to be yes, a part. Like, thank, it, sure. and, and that is true of most of my life. I, the the one part of my life that is impacted by, you know, by our social distancing, of course, is my, uh, the the part that normally is the part of me that plays out. But the, the rest of my life is, is actually pretty much the same. It like not leaving the house for a few days is pretty normal for me. Uh, cause my office is here on the same property as the house. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite fortunate at, at least at the moment. So, uh, but so you're right though. The ability to kind of connect here is really, I know it's incredibly valuable to me, you know, sitting here, you know, missing my friends, missing my kids, everything like that. So any bit of normalcy is really helpful. It is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's that, you know, we, it's social distancing, of course, is the term, but it's not social distancing because you and I are doing this. We as a community are doing this, right? This is our way of one of our ways of being social with each other. And I include you, our listeners in, in that, you know, in that whole mix here, we get to do this together. We have physical distancing for sure. Um, and for all the obvious reasons, but social distancing, I, I don't know that I like that term, although I'll, I'm happy to just go with it, but it, it, you know, there's always an asterisk for me. Like we get, well, it works because it's clinical, it's clinical, yes. you know, for accomplishing what, what health departments want. No, it gets it done. But, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to argue to change it, but I, like I said, in my own brain, I put an asterisk on it because we still do get to be social in this way that, like you said, is normal for us. So I got to do something um, this weekend that I didn't think I was going to get to do because South by Southwest was canceled, of course. And I was supposed to have been there until yesterday. And obviously I was not, uh, but I get to do something. There was, there's always, in fact, we talked about this last year when I was there, there's always, um, their film festival in addition to the music festival and the tech festival and the education festival, and as part of the film festival, there's a part where the music festival and the film festival collide. And that's the part of the film festival that they call 24 beats per second, uh, which is films about music. And there was one film in particular that I was really looking forward to seeing called Laurel Canyon, a place in time. And then I got an email from South by Southwest saying as a member of the press, Dave, you have access to our video streaming library for one week and one week only. And not every movie is in it. And when I looked initially, it, this Laurel Canyon movie was not in it. And then uh, a couple days later, they sent out an email. And they're like, you should check again because we've added more movies. And sure enough, I got to watch Laurel Canyon, a place in time. So it's a documentary about Laurel Canyon, which is an area of Los Angeles, just north of Hollywood, uh, where especially in the you know late 60s was it just turned into this hotbed of all of these you know amazing artists songwriters performers uh you know the Crosby Stills and Nash and the Flying Burrito Brothers and Frank Zappa was kind of already there he he was was sort of old royalty of of um of Laurel Canyon by that point. I mean, he wasn't, you know, his career was just starting, but, but everybody else saw him as like the guy that was already established there. Mm. Um, the, you know, the birds and Alice Cooper and, and all that. So like, it's this in Crosby still, no, I, I said Crosby stills Nash. That's right. Like all of this great stuff. Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles was part of the second. But this wave. is different than echo in the Canyon that that's been uh, streaming for a little while. Totally brand new movie. Yep. Okay. Um, and yes, there are right. There was that echo in the Canyon came out, I think three years, three or four years ago. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Netflix now. yep. And, um, this one, it, it was, you know, as, as a lot of documentaries do, they sort of focus around, you know, one or two people that, that are a thread that sort of moves throughout it and can be the storytellers. And 
one of the chief storytellers in this movie was a, a musician, but really a photographer named Henry Diltz. And this guy was everywhere. Like they, they, they were constantly showing some of his pictures, but it was like, oh, yeah, well, I just happened to be at, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, Linda's house and, and Joan, Joni was there, Joan Baez. And it was the first time Eric Clapton saw her play. And he's got a picture of Clapton sitting there in the grass in the field watching Ooh. Joan uh, Baez play a tune. Uh, sorry, not Joan Baez, Joni Mitchell play a tune. And and it's like, you know, and you can see the look on his face. He's like, whoa, like this is wow. You know, it, it's like there's a thing happening here. And um, and, and it, you know, so this guy was just in all the right places at all the right times it, and and really kind of wove a nice thread. So when this movie comes out, and I'm sure it will, uh, I highly recommend it. I had no idea that. Um, so Frank Zappa had started his record label called Bizarre Records. And he went to the whiskey one night club in whiskey, a go, go club in, in Los Angeles and watched Alice Cooper, uh, the, you know, with the whole band play and they completely emptied the club. And the, the only person left in the club was, was Frank and Frank didn't get it. And that's why he stayed there. He's like, I'm here and I don't get what you're doing. And neither does anybody else. And I've started Bizarre Records, and so I've found an act to sign. And that's how Alice I know. <laughs> this is how Alice Cooper is a name that we all know. Like, otherwise, it would not be the case. And so he told Alice and, you know, and the band, uh, be at my house, you know, in the studio tomorrow at 7. I uh, told them how to get there, where to get, load in their crap or whatever. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll, we'll make some magic together. And so they, you know, they get there diligently seven o'clock in the morning and you know, they're setting up their stuff. And as they're setting up, Frank comes in in his bathrobe with coffee and he's like, what the heck are you guys doing here? He's like, well, you said seven. He's like, yeah, it was seven at night. He's like, what musician shows up at seven in the morning? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So there was that. There were a couple of a couple of different things that just sort of that was one of them. Roger McGuinn is featured quite a bit in uh, the in the movie throughout. And he talked about the politics of the birds and how David Crosby didn't like being the wingman of the band. He was, you know, kind of he had his own ideas, but but they were always he, Rogers songs were always being chosen for the records, not David's. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it was because Roger was really friendly with their producer or their A&R guy or whatever it was. And so that's just, you know, politics. That's sort of how it worked out. So uh, he actually encouraged David to move on. And and um, again, this this Henry Diltz guy, I think, was was there like the, the first time that um, that Crosby, Stills and Nash like sang together. And the three, you know, everybody that was there said, OK, well, there's there's some magic here. And so then, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash took off. And then, of course, they, you know, kept bringing Neil Young in because nobody else in the band could play guitar as well as uh, Stephen Stills and Neil Young. Of course, they had played together in the Buffalo Springfield, which was another one of these, you know, Laurel Canyon kind of uh, things. And. Uh, and so that's how that all came together. And and I guess it was really cheap to live in Laurel Canyon at the time. It seemed like this, even to the people then, like they remember being super surprised when they found out like, oh, wouldn't it be awesome to live in Laurel Canyon? It's like, oh, actually, I can. Like, it's not that expensive, you know. And uh, Interesting. now that's Did not you the see case Echo now. in the Canyon. I have not seen that yet. No, I'd I'm, love for you to see it and, and talk about how the two. I'll put that on my list. Yeah. Echo in the Canyon sounds very, very similar. I mean, okay. it's... Um, yeah, how could, you know, how could it not be? Right. Yeah, how could it not be? You know, a lot of interviews with Crosby. Mm. Um, you know, the, the fun thing about it is, is Echo in the Canyon has concert snips. The The creator of Echo in the Canyon is Jacob Dylan, Bob Dylan's son, yep. the Wallflowers. And um, he's kind of the narrator and does a lot of the interviews. And then there's a concert where they're playing famous music by artists that originated in Laurel Canyon. Mm. And that gets kind of interjected into into the film in different ways so i found it really excellent really inspiring you know it's like you hear about these hotbeds of musical you know cauldron yeah 
you know, like swinging London in the sixties and, and, you know, New York folk scene in the early sixties. And, yeah. you know, it was the New York folk scene that moved everywhere. to Laurel Canyon. That's right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. Yeah. It's so, crazy. Anyway, they, you know, and actually we are kind of living in a golden time. I mean, for everybody that's out there that is on, on lockdown, self quarantining, social distancing. There's great, great, great content out there. I mean, I, like I said, Echo in the Canyon is wonderful. It's really, really a fun watch. Um, the uh, the documentary about Linda Ronstadt is awesome. It's beautiful. Mm, yeah. Um, there on Apple TV. There's a documentary coming out about the history of the Beastie Boys that looks really great. That um, was supposed to. That was, the Beastie Boys thing was also supposed to show at South by Southwest last week. That was uh, not part of the the streaming thing. There is a Johnny Cash movie, and actually, truth be told, I have one more day, so um, I'm going to try and watch that Johnny Cash movie tonight oh, very good. as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Twenty Feet from Stardom is fantastic. You know about about background singers that are you know obviously every bit as talented as the as the artists that they're supporting. Um, that's a f- fantastic film. There's a new one. I think it's called Sideman. And it's okay. all about, you know, kind of session musicians. I got to look that one up and we'll add it to the show notes. But there's another one that's streaming that's all about um, about the the vibe of session musicians. Yeah. And, uh, you just, you know, like Billy Joel's band is interviewed in it. And, you know, just really interesting what it's like to be well, that guy. And well, that's so like, there was, you know, there was a movie. On, there was a movie a number of years ago that came out about session. Uh, what was the name of it? Um, where Kenny Aronoff was was featured in it quite a bit, as was Liberty De- DeVito, um, and Liberty talked about his departure from Billy's band. Um, yeah, is is that the movie you're talking about? That's the one I'm thinking about. Yep. Oh, that's a fantastic movie. I, uh, I'll I'll come up with the name of it. I'll put it in uh, in the show notes. But that that but there's for a sure. lot of great content out there. There's a there's a super one about um, Metallica that's been streaming. Yes. 20 feet from starting might be my, my, might be my all time favorite, but um, there's a lot of, you know, while you're looking for stuff to do to find some inspiration, there's a lot of great stuff. Hired, has the, Hired Gun is the name of the movie that you're talking yep. about here. Great. Oh man. That's, that's like a must watch for anybody that listens to this show. Musician or you're listening to this show. You like the, a little bit of inside baseball. Uh, that movie is like all inside baseball, but with, like I said, you know, Kenny Aronoff, Liberty DeVito, uh, Steve Lukather is in it. Like well, people that you sort of know, um, but are the people responsible for keeping the machine going or at least, yeah. you know, we're temporarily on hiatus. But I think yeah. Netflix still has the Scorsese Rolling Thunder review documentary. Mm. There's a lot of really great yeah. stuff. So there were there were actually, there were a couple of things. I, I, I got to wrap up this Laurel Canyon thing, though, because there were a couple of things that 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 shined out at me that I wanted to share the first and I hadn't I'd never thought about this before the the house on the cover of that first Crosby Stills and Nash album you know where the the three of them are sitting on a mm-hmm. couch like on a porch on that couch mm-hmm. they that's the picture they wanted they realized oh this is it this this you know encapsulates what we are but we're sitting in the wrong order it's Nash Stills Crosby and so they Turn, they flipped the picture around. They experimented with that. But then uh, Stephen Stills was playing his guitar left handed and they were like, well, I don't know. Like, that might freak people out. So can't do that. Uh, for some reason, I, I don't know. Like my guess is most people would never have even noticed that. But anyway, uh, so they decided, well, let's just go back tomorrow and we'll, you know, take the picture the right way. They get back. The house had been raised. It was like it was an abandoned house. They had just sort of found it. It was serendipitous. And they, when they went back the next day, it was dust. How funny. <laughs> yeah. So the picture is in the wrong order on the album cover for that reason. Um, and at some point in the movie, somebody and I, I wrote down the quote, but I did not attribute it. So you're going to have to remember when you watch it to look for this. But uh, it, I, I want to say it was Jackson Brown. He was in this a lot. And, and that guy definitely knows how to turn a phrase. But um, somebody said, you know, or maybe it was maybe it was Joni Mitchell. It was definitely Joni Mitchell. Maybe the truth doesn't rhyme, which I thought was interesting. I like that. That is great. And there was another moment where they were flipping through uh, LP covers, you know, from the various bands that, that were being discussed and artists and stuff. And I saw the stereo label on one of them and it brought me back. It was like, right. That used to be a thing like 
not all at most albums were not stereo. They were all just mono. Right. And then you could buy them in stereo if you wanted. And, you know, if you had a system where that mattered. So just, it was just one of those things, it was, you know, nice little Fun stuff. All right, put it all in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. It's there. So, so um, go ahead. I'm thinking that, uh, you know, you didn't have a gig this weekend. I didn't have a gig this weekend, but everybody seems to be trying to figure out how to do some streaming, you know, as a way to stay in, to stay performing, to stay in touch with people, to offer some happiness to people, you know, in these, and, 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 you know, there's huge artists that are doing these things, certainly local artists that are doing these types of things. And it, it is, it is the scene right now, right? It is, it is the state of the art of the scene right now. Are you finding it in New Hampshire that a lot oh, of people are taking streaming? Absolutely. Yeah. I've watched, well, I've, I've noticed a couple of things. Yes. First of all, any, anybody who has any uh, skill with an acoustic guitar, or even a keyboard is in like, they're all set. They don't, they set up their iPhone on a music stand and stream for hours. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. Cause as I watch these streams and it's, I've been, I've been enjoying these streams for the most yes. part. Like they, there have been very like emotional, sad moments for me. Like I was watching my friend Matt Langley the other night and he started playing an Eagle song that we do together all the time. And he's like, oh, I'm missing the harmonies. And it was like, yeah, man, you know, me too. Like this sucks. <laughs> but by and large, it's great to see my friends performing and, um, and you know, and, and just all of it. And I don't, I get to see my friends do these things. Like I said last week that I don't normally get to see, but as I look at the viewer numbers, you know, Matt had 75, 80 people, it's like, man, I've played gigs with Matt where we've had, you know, a quarter of that and it's felt like a good crowd. <laughs> yeah. So that part's interesting to me. Like there, there, of course, you know, the, the nice part was, and I shared a couple of these things on our, uh, in our gig gab group, just for me, because it's like, you know, I talk about these folks on the show all the time. And, and now, you know, if, if you're not in like my local area, the chances of you ever getting to see any of these people that I talk about are just. Right. non-existent but now they're very much existent and no matter where you are if you've got a you know phone or a computer that can watch a video on facebook you're good to go so that's well that's the cool. thing is is yeah. this is happening very organically and very quickly so yeah you know simon from my band jumped right on it mm -hmm. and he, he viewed it as kind of online busking trying to replace some um some income that you know from all the lost gigs he had which right totally makes sense to that's, me that's the simon we talked about last week right yeah. And, you know, and he's actually um, he's actually doing it quite regularly. Sometimes he's doing two in a day. And, you know, but, but his frame of mind is that this is busking. Right. Right. And 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 then um, Mike Mendoza, the sax player from my band, did a show on Saturday. Um, so what he did was he got some backing tracks to a bunch of Stevie Wonder, a bunch of jazz tinged backing tracks and he played basically a solo saxophone show and he's great and he's really entertaining and he so he did one and it was super and then my friends mary ellen and tom they did their first one so a couple observations here one is people are really appreciative of this i mean i mean you talk about people who are looking to stay connected they're used to going to shows and seeing their friends and you know especially using facebook live where there's a chat function um, there, it strikes me that there's a sense of community. It's not bulletproof. You know, the technology is not bulletproof. I mean, no. and everything from so simple as I think the default on Facebook live, when you expand the window is that sound is turned off and people didn't understand why they weren't getting sound. Yeah. You literally have to click the speaker, but I don't know why they do, I don't know why that's the default or whether that's configurable, but that was definitely throwing people for a loop. But from the communal aspect of it, people really, really, really appreciate it. They, you know, the, they, it's good for them to see their friends. It's good for them to chat. It's good for them to feel social. The music is, is heartfelt and, and, you know, washes over you. It is, Saturday night was fortuitous. I don't know if my three friends talked to each other and said, you do this hour, you do this hour, this hour, but so many people are doing it and starting to promote their shows that, you know, this stuff is going to kind of bonk on top of each other. So Absolutely. like a typical Friday or Saturday night where, where multiple people might be gigging at any one time, um, this stuff is, is uh, structurally, you know, from a time perspective, uh, I think it's good that musicians should talk and try and, 
and get, you know, and again, people can leave the stream on all day long. They can, they can sit and watch it attentively. They can keep it on in the background. Well, and you can watch it things. after the fact too. You don't, that's like, true. The, if the person who did the, the social stream, part isn't there on the, on the after the fact though. Correct. So if that, yeah. and if that's what you need, then, then you make your decisions there. Absolutely. Um, so, sci- and it's interesting to me, like we ended the last episode and I was saying like, well, Simon didn't, he just kind of, you know, put his phone up and people really liked it. So what would happen if you, you know, made a room in your house look like a video studio and nice backdrop and all that type of stuff. It seems to not be a thing. I mean, even big artists, some of them are doing them from their home studios, but like Neil Diamond did a song in front of his fireplace with his dog there. Johnny uh, Resnick, I think from the Goo Goo Dolls yep. um, did one sitting on the porch of his house. And so it's not about production. I think it's about the intimacy of um, uh, an authenticity of just grabbing a guitar or in the moment and doing it that way. One thing that is I, interesting. I will put a pin in that though. I want to come back to that. I, I, okay. I, I, we can do it now or, or if you want to finish your thought, that's fine too. Um, no, let's do it now. Okay. And I'm guessing what you're going to say is that one caveat, the visuals might not be as important, but the audio is a very, is a very solvable thing. Although I will tell you this in terms of visuals, one of my friends did one. And well, I'm hang talk on, about this hang on. Bit. I'm going to say my thing instead of letting you assume my Go thing. Ahead. Okay. Because it's, it's not really that. Go. It's that we've seen this before, right? When podcasting first got started, mm. it was, don't worry about the quality. Just like get started and do it. Don't spend all, you know, don't give yourself the excuse of not starting because you don't have the right gear you don't have the right theme music you're not quite sure the best way to like there don't worry about the best just go do it and evolve as you go and a lot of people sort of didn't pay attention to that evolve as you go but enough did to where they're really very quickly and and, you know i'm rewinding 15 years here but that's okay uh very quickly there was a a separation between the people that were spending time caring about audio quality and video production quality. And I was one of them, but I, I was lucky. I knew like I had lots of gear cause I'm this guy too. I'm the music guy. I knew how to use a microphone. I knew how to use a compressor. Of course I know a lot more about it now, but I knew how to make audio quality good. I also thought about, well, I don't want the sound of my bouncy room being added to the sound of your bouncy car. So I'm going to record a really tight audio profile and then let you bounce that around in your environment. So you're not, you know, making it sound good. So I, 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 I don't think I know that the same thing will happen here right now. Everybody is tolerant of this because by and large, we're all sort of experiencing it the same way. You know, like you said, from pros to, to, to you know, weekend warriors or or even just people that have never left their bedroom and now are performing for the first time. Everybody's sort of being like, all right, I'm going to set up my phone and do it. The good news is the quality of that ain't that bad. It's pretty good even, you know, but there will be those people simply uh, perhaps out of boredom who decide to up the game. Right. And I've already we've already seen this like, you know, Simon's using a little bit of reverb like he upped his game out of the gate and I'm Mm -hmm. seeing people do that. And I think very, very quickly uh, we will see there will be a separation between the people that are just still, quote unquote, just doing it on their phones. And then the folks that really take the time to care and also worrying about, you know, is my Internet connection good enough? Is it like is my stream constantly breaking up because my Wi-Fi is kind of crappy, but right now everybody's sort of tolerant of that, that that won't fly just like it wouldn't fly if this show broke up all the time. You folks wouldn't listen because you're listening to other podcasts where that doesn't happen. You know, so so there is the the bar will naturally rise Uh, as always. There will be exceptions if the artist like let's say uh you know paul mccartney decides you know what uh a a year from now like whatever i'm gonna do a live stream from my from my kitchen and it doesn't matter you know who cares like everybody's gonna watch that anyway even if it's not you know above the quality bar that uh that we've gotten used to but uh but by and large i i think that you know, there will be that that separation of well, I'm not going to watch that guy again. That that was awful, you know, not because of the performance, but because it didn't look good. It didn't sound good. The experience wasn't good. So unless I'm really attached to that artist, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go for the yeah, people so, that's a little bit better. So 
be beware so of that. I would actually extract what you're saying and, and say that there is coming a wealth of tools and platforms that are going to facilitate that. So um, I got an a email from the smart people at Sure the other day. Yeah. They sell a, a, a mobile pod, mobile audio kit. It's basically a Sure microphone, Sure USB microphone, a tripod, and a little light, right? Okay. And it's like 200 bucks. And most of that is the microphone. And um, basically what they're saying is for 200 bucks. Oh, and so, you know, you put the, you put the phone on the tripod. The microphone is superior to what is in your phone. Is this and, the MV88 you know, Plus yes, thing? Yes, okay. that's the one. That yeah. MV88 is a great mic. I've got one that's of those. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. like the, the entry level to getting very good sound is not that far. It's now, not that yeah, far. Actually, not only that, now you don't have to prop your phone up on something. Now you get a little bit of light. and all, So the tools to do that. And then similarly, what I was saying before about like, I'm lucky that I had three good friends that kind of figured out how to do consecutive time slots. That's not going to keep going. There's not enough times nope. in the good times of day. It's going to be like a normal Friday or Saturday night when people are gigging out. So how do you find out what's going on? And also there's big artists who are doing these things as well for totally free. And so there are some platforms that um, there's one called stage it. I think you had a, an idea of a different platform. And these are like, these are instead of Facebook, you can, you know, basically go to these shows and, the, and some of these platforms allow you to uh, add some video quality. I get, we'll talk about OBS in a, little, in a, in a few minutes, but um, I had a friend who did a show and they did it as a benefit for a local venue and the sign that they put up with the, um, with the where to donate wasn't readable, right? It was too small and sure. you know, it wasn't readable. Yep. So, you know, if you had a little bit of savvy, could you put it in a lower third on your video screen that pops in and out every once in a while is not obtrusive, looks right. good, you know? So, you know, th those types of incremental skills, if you kind of think about, you know, in the beginning, if you knew how to use a word processor, you were ahead of the game. And then, Lord forbid, if you learned how to use a spreadsheet, you were farther ahead of the game. And those are basic skills now. Um, you know, GarageBand provides basic skills for getting musical thoughts into your into your computer. More than basic, but certainly. Yeah, yeah but, but not like basic. not like Pro Tools or Logic. That's right. right. Yep. Right. And so it would seem like and, you know, most musicians are going to be concerned about about audio quality. And of the three that my friends did this weekend, two were just a room mic. And one was actually taking sound out of a mixing board and feeding it right into Facebook Live. And then I should also add that there is, are services that you can sign up with where you stream to them and then they stream it to all the major services. So there's a lot of people who have a problem with Facebook. I totally get it. YouTube allows these things. Instagram allows these things. There's a, um, a service called Recast. And I think there's other ones as well. Isn't that re where you, you mentioned Restream last restream, week. Restream. I'm sorry. Okay. Restream. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the, uh, and my point to all this is that tools and platforms, everything from microphones and tripods to, to, to full on restreaming platforms. I think that's, what's going to create this. I mean, Oh, for there's sure. A, yeah, it's there's funny. a cottage industry that's growing up right around our eyes right now. Absolutely. Trey Anastasio from Fish has been putting out uh, one new song a day, at least for the last four days. He and oh. he and Tom Marshall, who is is like the longtime Fish lyricist, uh, he and Tom used to. Well, they, I mean, hopefully they will again, but they would schedule time to like get together for three days and just like write a bunch of songs, you know, with Tom's lyrics and Trey's music. And they just put it all together. And uh, it feels like I, I don't know. I haven't talked to Tom or certainly haven't talked to Trey, but I haven't I, I don't know that that's what's going on here. But it seems like the results of what's happening with Trey every day are exactly that, like that somehow they're working together, you know, remotely. And then Trey's like putting out these songs. But this sure MV88 kit would be perfect for him because yesterday he did this thing where he was standing up for the first time. I was like, OK, that's interesting. And. Then he posted a picture where he had taped his iPhone and a microphone and a speaker <laughs> to his closet door or something so that he could have it all at the right height for him. <laughs> it's like, dude, there's but that's it. Like you said, right now, everybody's just sort of like 
experimenting and it's the Wild West and anything goes and we'll figure out what actually goes and what doesn't. I think it's good. Yeah, I um, uh, the local theater near me has been using a service called Crowdcast.io to kind of I think it's similar to the stage it thing that you mentioned, Paul, where it allows them to stream things, but they can charge, you know, mm-hmm. every viewer And I also think it allows them to control the audience size, which is important, or at least measure the audience side, which is important because I think they've, uh, if they haven't yet, they're going to start doing some like shows where they need to have rights and you pay for the rights by the size of your Mm -hmm. audience and all, you know, all of that. So in addition to actually making money, it allows them to track all that. Whereas Facebook is, you know, kind of just once you blast it out there, you know, the numbers are whatever they're funny, right? You don't, you don't really know. You just know that it's like people watch, but you can't pay wallet or anything like that. So, yeah. And so, uh, are we ready to talk about tech? Cause I've dug into this pretty heavily in the last 48 hours here, Paul. One, one last thought yeah. I, I have about, sure. about this and in, in my area, my friends, some have done this as virtual busking. Some have done this as um, benefits for venues that they have a close association with that they're trying to, you know, funnel some goodwill, some money to, to help them so that there's a venue to play when they, when this all blows over. Right. Yep. And um, I don't, I don't really have much of a view on this. I mean, it dawns on me that this goes back somewhat to that time honored argument about, you know, Musicians should charge for their services. Nothing wrong with giving away if you choose to giving away your services. But, you know, does the question I I would ask, I don't even know if you have any thoughts on this, but does this make it harder for the busking guy just trying to keep some money coming in if these are our benefit things? And are we too early into this process for the benefit things to have started? I mean, certainly people are hurting right now and I totally get it, but it, uh, it is a stark a stark exercise in, in people's brands, you know, of the, again, I'll just use my area. You know, there's, there's maybe 200 really loyal music fans who tend to populate most of my, my friends shows. Sure. If you're the one guy busking versus the one guy donating, is that a, from a musician's perspective, is that an, is that a commentary on your brand and I don't know the answer to this because I guess I think it's too early, but do you have any thoughts as to whether whether there's a, a value proposition, whether we're too early into this, that donations to venues are going to be happening? Is it enough of a donation to a venue to make a difference? Um, does it does it does it hurt the busking musician? Um, yeah, I mean, again, everybody's figuring out, everybody's taking a different approach to what it means to do this stuff. Um, do you have any thoughts on it? I, yeah, I, well, it, it is too early for, in, in my opinion, it's too early for us to like start drawing lines and saying, this is wrong. This is right. I think it's excellent that you brought up this topic because getting all of us thinking about it, like we know how we feel about people that are willing to go and play, you know, gigs for 12 bucks and nachos and what that does to the performing musician, uh, vibe and and culture and community that, that you know that's bad uh, but along those lines you know doing a gig for a benefit where the musician isn't getting any money like that that seems to be a thing that, that most people are okay with most working musicians are okay with and and i don't mean to overgeneralize obviously there's, mm-hmm. there's there's exceptions all the way through what i just said but now with this it's like okay I'm getting started. I'm trying to figure it out. Yes, I'm an established performing artist in my area, but, uh, you know, this online thing is new. I don't even know if I've got the quality right. I don't want to necessarily charge people and jump right to this restream or crowdcast thing or sorry, stage it or crowdcast restreams different. So uh, I can see the I'm going to give this away for a little while and, and see what happens thing. And. But it also makes total sense that people, you know, like you said, Simon, right out of the gate was with here's my tip jar and and, you know, pulling a little money and that there's to me, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot right with that. I think that's a smart move. Um, It allows people to kind of, you know, share what they feel they they can when everything's uncertain right now. So that's good. Um, And as far as sharing, you know, doing 
for a musician choosing to do a benefit for a venue, essentially donating all of the, their, their, their proceeds towards the venue. I, I think again, right now, I, I kind of like the idea of let's do what we can to support our local businesses that are going to be hit pretty hard by people not leaving their houses and keeping those doing, you know, how do we, uh, how do we make sure that those folks also, you know, have a little bit of money to spend on food and, and things like that? You know, I, I think that's important right now in a general sense. And if you're doing it for the club owner versus doing it for the yarn shop owner, um, you know, either way is, is fine. I mean, we talked last week about buying gift certificates from your, you know, favorite local vendors and things like that. Uh, this is a, an, another sort of, spin on that and i think it's okay i, I mean we're gonna we don't know anything we're, we're gonna figure we're figuring it all out we're figuring it all out yeah i will I say that okay. my last thought on this is that i'm i'm fat i'm fascinated by the fact that that um the conceptualizing of this is very local even though the opportunity for this is global it's global right? Like, yeah right so yeah. you know I, my friends have thought about doing this, you know, addressing a fairly local audience who they know. Yeah. But really, you know, and the thing about moving to these other platforms is they will promote it globally, right? That's one of the services that they offer. Totally. Um, you know, put you on a lineup. We have a, another friend, Matthew Rothenberg, who said, hey, there, there should be something that at least keeps a listing of all these various, you know. Well, that's where opportunity events. knocks, right? Is somebody yeah. that, that there is a lack of attention paid to this online. I mean, people, this is not the first time people have online streamed. It's the first time some people have. It is certainly the first time when that's the only option we have in terms of seeing live music and in terms of performing. So more people are doing it, but there, you know, there's an opportunity here for someone to create a resource of, okay, are you interested in this? Do you like this kind of music? I want to listen to, you know, uh, AC 40, you know, covers being played on an acoustic guitar. Like, you know, you could probably narrow it all down and, and music genome project the thing and be like, all right, you're going to love this. Okay, great. And then you love it. Um, all right. So we're, we're at 37 minutes in, uh, I don't want to be cut short talking about the tech. So I want to defer that to next week, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to leave all of you hanging. So I'm going to say this, go check out OBS studio. Uh, it's a piece of software that lets you mix a live video stream and you it's can a have free piece of software. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very important. <laughs> key. Yes. No, it, it is. And so with OBS, you can, uh, I mean, you can, it is super powerful. Uh, I used it yesterday. I've, I've messed with it before, but I decided, all right, we got to dive in. So our Mac geek gab podcast, which we do generally we record every Sunday morning. When I did it yesterday, instead of live streaming, just the audio, which we've been doing for years, I live stream video. Uh, and I did it using OBS just as a test. I messed some things up. I had double audio for me for a little while, which sounded like crap. And I apologize to anybody who heard that. But um, but, you know, that's it. Right. If we're figuring these things out and OBS worked great, it was super easy to set up. I decided to do it at nine o'clock yesterday morning and we started streaming at 10 o'clock yesterday morning and I had time to get breakfast in there. So, I mean, it. yes, I'm a geek. Yes, I've used these things before, but it's really fairly straightforward to get set up you just sort of drag um the things around you create little scenes and one scene could just be you with a camera and one could be you with another camera and so i'll put um and and these are the kinds of things you could have one camera like on your face or at you as a whole and one maybe aimed just at your guitar so people can see your hands and you know get some different focus back and forth you can have it do some auto fades between them so go download obs as paul pointed out it is free and you're going to be able to play with it and get a feel for it because this is the thing we were, we were talking before about the next level. This is the kind of thing that your quote unquote competition is already looking at. The people that will be competing with you already know how to do this. There's other tools, too. In fact, there's there's something that I'm going to recommend that's uh, better than OBS. But I'm, I'm going to save that until next week. Send in your questions about 
uh, any of this stuff. I've been, like I said, I've been doing audio online for a very long time. Uh, it, you know, we, we, if we don't have the answer, I know the people to get it from, and, and I'm happy to say, I don't know the answer, but I, you know, I'll ask and we can, we can become that resource for you. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Uh, I think this is going to be an important part of our, our tech, you know, and gear discussions, uh, for a little while here, cause we don't need PA speakers right now, but we do need a way to, um, reinforce our sound and deliver it properly to our audiences uh and and this is this is the current way of doing that so please do send in your questions feedback at giggabpodcast.com and we'll we'll pull it all together and i've i've got a lot to say about this we'll probably do a you know 20 minute segment next week or whatever about it you know just to get into it but i didn't want to didn't want to cut it short for anybody so that's our start though obs studio is is where you're going to begin and then we'll we'll pick up next week and kind of get you there it's good it's good Anything else, Paul, before we uh, before we call this one? Wash your hands. It is. Yeah, that's that's kind of the thing. You know, um, I even wash your hands, even if you haven't gone out, because you never know if you or any of the people in your house with you might already have, you know, this thing going on. And so it's good. That's good. It's stay crazy. safe, everybody. Stay healthy. Yeah. Stay healthy and stay, this. stay as productive as you can. In order to keep your mind occupied so you're not just sitting around. I think that's... that's My wife just sent me a text message while we are doing this, and I thought it was great. She was like, you know, all this talk about bailout packages and what are essential services that need to keep open. Is there anything more an essential service than music? Uh, I like it. I like it. That's it. All right. Well, always be performing, folks, and uh, stay safe. Even while you stream. Even while you stream.